Law of the Old World, Chapter 4, The Rise of Men Whilst the elves and dwarves were forging alliances in the Old World, the primitive and barbaric race of man was building its first cities in the hot and arid lands of the south. From the nomadic desert tribes of Nehakara, the first true human civilization was forming. The ancient kingdom of Nehakara was at its most powerful when other human tribes were still primitive and savage. Over long centuries, Nehakara, known to its people as the Great Land, had risen out of the desert to become a powerful civilization with a sophisticated religion and an advanced system of government. Small settlements had grown into great cities, vast roads were constructed, and fleets of ships built to connect each city to its neighbours. Mighty kings ruled the people, and raised disciplined armies to fight in their name. Greatest of these cities was Khemri, the city of kings, and by tradition, whoever ruled there was considered first among equals. The other cities were each governed by their own king, though all showed loyalty and paid tribute to Khemri. Together, these kings subdued the tribes in the surrounding lands, drove back the orc hordes, and ruled from the western deserts to the eastern Sea of Dread. At the height of Nehekara's power, it had expanded and conquered lands as far north as what would come to be known as the Empire, south into the primordial jungles of the Southlands, and even east to the foreboding Darklands. The king's armies marched across the world, subjugating all before them, and their vast fleets of galleys and war barks terrorised the great ocean. The cursed city of Tylos was founded between the Arana Mountains and the Tilian Sea by savage tribes of primitive men. These nomadic tribes had come to the rich and fertile lands in pursuit of the great herds of migratory beasts they hunted, and eventually to trade their meagre wares atop a broad hill. In time, this meeting place became home to farmers, shepherds, and craftsmen. Then, as the tribes intermarried and their numbers grew, great stockade walls were erected to defend the settlers. Soon after, a wandering clan of dwarf prospectors and miners also found the area. Immediately they recognised the richness that lay within the mountains and the earth, and the two races formed an alliance. With the arrival of the dwarfs, the city grew rapidly. Wooden stockades were replaced with mighty walls of dressed stone. Log-built longhouses were pulled down, and in their place, tall towers of granite climbed to the sky. The prosperity of the lands, and the alliance between men and dwarfs, allowed the city to reach great heights of architecture and culture within a single human generation. The crowning jewel of the city would be a great bell tower, which would stand unrivalled as the highest structure ever erected in the old world, and would extend as far below the earth as it did above. Though Nehekara prospered and its cities grew in wealth, its many kings thirsted for greater power. To this end, the kings began raising their armies and marching to war against one another to prove their might and worthiness to wear the crown of Nehekara. For a time, this symbol of rulership over all of the great land passed from king to conquering king. Dozens of monarchs rose and fell during this time, their names quickly becoming lost to history. As the cities warred, the great land became vulnerable to attacks from invading enemies. Hordes of orcs and savage tribes of men descended upon Nehekara from the north, slaughtering, plundering, looting and laying waste to all before them. These invasions and the constant internecine warfare, combined with years of drought during which the great Vitae river ran dry, took a heavy toll upon Nehekara. Pestilence and famine came to the great land as the meagre crops, those that had escaped being burned by rampaging enemies, withered in the fields for lack of hands to harvest them. No single city's army, exhausted as they were from disease, starvation and unremitting war, could hope to hold back the tide of invaders alone. Yet the arrogant and distrustful kings refused to put aside their differences and form a lasting alliance, bending their knee to another or halt in the pursuit of domination over their rivals. 
The first great civilization of man stood on the brink of destruction. If the Nehekarans could not be unified, they would all perish. When Setra came to the throne of Khemri, he was a vain and egotistical man who demanded the adoration of his subjects, but he was no fool. He listened to the counsel of his priests and knew that only a king who commanded the respect of the gods would earn the full adulation of the people. To this end, Setra humbled himself before the ancient gods of Nehekara. In a great ritual, Setra beseeched the gods to restore Khemri to its former glory and grant him the strength to conquer his rivals. The next day, the great Vite River flooded for the first time in several decades. This was seen as a sign by both the priesthood and the population that Setra was indeed chosen by the gods. Setra had become the first priest king of Khemri, a ruler who commanded not only the unswerving loyalty of his people and his legions, but who also wielded the power of the gods. Setra was also a ruthless warlord, his keen mind matched only by his courage and martial skill. One by one he brought the cities of Nehekara to heel, always leading his armies from the front. With every victory, more warriors flocked to his banner. Before long, vast legions marched at Setra's command, and the kings of Nehekara bowed before him, swearing oaths of fealty and acknowledging Khemri as the pre-eminent city of the land once more. With his rivals subjugated and the great land united against invaders, the king of kings had restored Nehekara to greatness. In his arrogance, Setra had become obsessed with his own mortality, and under his rule the priesthood of Nehekara became similarly obsessed. From this compulsion was born the mortuary cult, and Nehekara's greatest and most powerful priests were tasked by their great king with unlocking the secrets of immortality and the afterlife. In their research, the priests learned much and used their powers to extend Setra's life far beyond its natural span. Yet the priests could not halt the inevitable, merely postpone it, and they continued to search in vain for a way to accomplish their appointed task. With the passing of the years, they learned to preserve a corpse from decay through the elaborate art of mummification. They began harnessing the winds of magic, devising a law of magical incantations and rituals with which they hoped to bridge the gap between life and death. They believed that with careful preparation and the proper invocations, the dead could one day return to life in immortality. Though he raged at the priest's failings, Setra commanded that a vast burial tomb be constructed for his body to rest within until the mortuary cult finished their work and he could be reborn into the eternal life he so craved. And so, when the King of Kings finally succumbed to his mortality, powerful incantations were intoned over his corpse, and he was embalmed with a great ritual. Preserved against decay, the body of Setra was entombed within a mighty sarcophagus in the heart of a majestic pyramid of shining white stone. With the passing of Setra, the mortuary cult continued to grow in size and influence, whilst increasing its knowledge and power. As the cult grew, so too did the necropolises of the rulers of Nehekara. Great tomb cities sprang up around the cities of the living, growing in size and grandeur with each generation. Into this powerful priesthood came Nagash, son of King Ketep of Khemri. Filled with pride and greed, Nagash coveted both the rank of high priest and the throne of Khemri, which, by right of birth, passed to his brother, Thutep. As he rose in power, Nagash gathered about himself a cabal of acolytes, and, one dark night, Nagash and his followers murdered Thutep's guards and entombed the king alive within the pyramid of his father. The next morning, blood still staining his hands and surrounded by his acolytes, Nagash took his place upon the empty throne. For the people of Nehekara, the rule of Nagash was a dark time. The usurper cared not at all for the well-being of his subjects, desiring only to increase his sorcerous powers and attain his own immortality. Nagash experimented with many dark magics, extending his life and the lives of those closest to him through the use of foul elixirs. He studied death and began to corrupt the rites of the mortuary cult for darker purposes. 
Evil creatures and undead revenants stalked the streets of Kemri by night, preying upon the living, and the winds of magic blew powerfully around the fear-shrouded city. In the land of Tilia, the elders of Tylos had commissioned their dwarf allies to aid in the building of a mighty bell tower, which would climb from foundations far below the earth to stand higher than the tallest tower. The work had taken many years, and many masons had dedicated their lives to a tower they would never see reach its full height. But as the tower neared completion, the dwarfs could not raise the mighty brass bell up to the distant belfry. The elders of Tylos lamented and prayed for a solution. Those prayers seemed answered when a hooded stranger came to Tylos, offering to raise the bell and complete the tower. All this stranger asked in return was that he be allowed to inscribe a dedication to his god upon the bell. The elders agreed, and at the stranger's request, returned to their homes that he might work unseen. The following morning, the bell tower stood complete, though of the stranger there was no sign. As the people of Tylos looked on in amazement, not realising anything was amiss, the bell began to toll far above. When the bell tolled a thirteenth time, the skies darkened, and a rain of warpstone began to fall, corrupting the city and poisoning the earth for miles around turning rich farmlands into fetid swamps. The terrified people of Tylos ran to the dwarves of the dwarf mines, but found them barred. Locked within their minds, the dwarves were overrun by an endless tide of loathsome vermin. Tylos was no more, and within its bleak, twisted ruins, evil creatures would walk. In Kemri, Nagash had commanded that a vast black pyramid be built in his honor. Once complete, the structure would dwarf even the tomb of Setra, and the sorcerous powers of Nagash would be amplified beyond imagining. The winds of magic harnessed to his every whim by the pyramid's arcane geometries. Yet the tithe demanded for the pyramid's construction would prove Nagash's undoing. Across Nehekara, impoverished priest kings rebelled against their cruel overlord, and the horrors rampant within his accursed court United in defiance, the priest kings plotted to overthrow the tyrant. In response, Nagash used his infernal powers to rage a legion of skeletons from the necropolis. This was both the first glimpse of Nagash's true power, and the first time the dead walked the world at the will of another. The horror proved too much for many. City after city fell before Nagash's might, their dead swelling the ranks of his undead legions, and their defeated kings bowing before the great necromancer. Yet Nagash underestimated the resolve of his enemies, and a mighty coalition was formed between seven kings that refused to bend the knee. Beside the seven kings' armies marched cohorts of animated constructs empowered by the magic of the mortuary cult, great stone colossi driven by the souls of mighty heroes. With such potent allies, the army of the seven kings vanquished the undead legions of Nagash, and his most trusted acolytes were slain. Yet of the great necromancer himself, there was no sign. Nagash had escaped his enemies. Fleeing from his enemies, Nagash wandered in the desert. Thirst parched his throat and hunger gnawed his gut. Yet the great necromancer trudged on, haunted by dark visions. Some claimed that Nagash died as he wandered, the force of his will alone returning his spirit to his desiccated corpse. In time, Nagash came to the banks of the Sour Sea, beneath the shadow of Cripple Peak. Millennia before, a huge chunk of warpstone had struck the mountain, splitting it wide. Long years of wind and rain had caused the warpstone to leach into the land, mutating it and turning it into a wasteland where no natural thing flourished. When Nagash drank the bitter water of the Sour Sea, he was invigorated. Realising a source of great power lay close, Nagash determined to discover it. For long years, Nagash lived as a hermit on the banks of the Sour Sea, experimenting with warpstone to increase his power. By night, he visited the charnel pits of the degenerate human tribes of the region, perfecting his obscene spells and raising the corpses of the dead to do his bidding. He came to be worshipped as a god by the tribes. The wretched souls worked tirelessly alongside the reanimated husks of their kin. Mining warpstone from beneath the mountain to fuel their master's hunger 
and building a great fortress. Cripple Peak became the centre of a swarming empire where living and dead alike served their master tirelessly, their flesh and bones the fuel that drove Nagash's obsession. In the city of Lamia, allies of Nagash secretly studied his dark arts from stolen tomes and, under his subtle influence, created an elixir which blessed them with long lives, great strength and vitality, but cursed them with a terrible thirst for the blood of the living and an aversion to the light of the sun. Over time, these allies grew in power and influence. Dark rumours spread that unclean things stalked the streets of Lamia, and the dead walked among the living. Enraged by these rumours, the priest kings of Nehekara were drawn into a long and bloody war against Lamia. Though the armies of the priest kings suffered greatly, the vampires were defeated and Lamia razed to the ground. With the fall of Lamia, those vampires not slain fled north, drawn by instinct towards the sanctuary of Cripple Peak. Arriving at the carrion court of the great necromancer, they were welcomed and given command of vast armies of the undead raised by Nagash in anticipation of this moment, and ready to march against the weakened armies of Nehekara at his bidding. But Nagash had underestimated his enemy. The war against Lamia had not weakened Nehekara. Instead, the great land had grown powerful under the rule of the mighty al Kadizar the Conqueror. Under his inspired leadership, the armies of Nehekara faced the legions of Nagash boldly, and battle after battle was won. Defeated, the vampires fled across the desert to Cripple Peak, bringing their master the news of their failure. Enraged, Nagash chose to end all life in Nehekara, so that he might rule free from petty and rebellious mortals. To this end, he polluted the great Vitae River with terrible contagions, poisoning the land. Within weeks, those that had succumbed to plague outnumbered the living and the streets were choked with corpses, as fully nine-tenths of the population perished. While his people died, al Kadizar sat upon his throne powerless, as undead armies marched all but unopposed into Khemri. With Nehekara reduced to a land of corpses, Nagash began the next phase of his plan. In a days-long ritual, he consumed vast quantities of warpstone, and the souls of whole tribes of his followers sacrificed upon his black altar. Bloated with power, he began the incantation of his greater spell, the Great Awakening, a spell that would raise every corpse the world over and bind them to his will. Even as Nagash completed his ritual, al Kadizar, captured and kept alive as a trophy within the deepest dungeon below Cripple Peak, was mysteriously freed by hunched and heavily cloaked creatures. A powerful blade made of purest warpstone was pushed into his hands and he was guided, stumbling towards Nagash's throne room. Through sheer force of will, al Kadizar summoned the strength to swing his baleful sword and cut the hated necromancer down. Nagash roared as the terrible blade ended his unnatural life and the energies of his accursed spell spiralled out of his control, sweeping across Nehekara and stirring the vast legions of dead into a shadowy unlife. With the death, death of Nagash, al Kadizar fled Crippled Peak, taking with him the great necromancer's crown. With his sanity shredded by the horrors he had witnessed, the once mighty king wandered lost through foreign lands until dying of hunger and thirst he fell into the icy waters of the Blighted River. Sometime later, the frozen corpse, still clutching the crown of Nagash, was found by a shaman named Kadon. Pulling the crown from the dead king's frozen grip and placing it upon his head, Kadon's mind filled with vision and arcane knowledge. Returning to his tribe, Kadon brought great prophecies. He had the unknown king entombed beneath a mound upon which was built a temple, and around which Kadon's people built their dwellings. Kadon named this place Morcain, and as it grew from the infertile soil of the Badlands, other settlements emerged around it, slowly at first, but more quickly as the magic of Kadon provided tireless labour 
in the form of armies of the undead, and the realm of Strigos was born. Drawn by the presence of Nagash's crown, darker things came to Morgaine. Among these was the vampire Ushuran, who slew Kadon and usurped his throne. Under the rule of Asharon, Strigois prospered until the coming of a great orc war saw Morcane sacked and the mighty Ashuran slain by the potent magic of a powerful orc shaman. With the destruction of Morcane, the crown of Nagash was lost and the many tomes of magical lore transcribed by Kadon were scattered far and wide, carried by those fleeing the destruction.